Welcome to worship this morning at Middleton Community United Church of Christ, where we say that no matter who you are or where you are on your faith journey, you are welcome here. I'm the Reverend Zaina Tomley, my pronouns are she, hers, and I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning, whether you are here in the sanctuary or worshiping with us uh, from home, welcome. I'd invite you to let us know that you're worshiping with us through the Friendship Pads by using your phone to sign in to our digital Friendship Pad through a QR code. If you're at home, I'd invite you to use that option and let us know that you are worshiping with us today. We have a centering question to begin today. I invite you to think about someone or someones who are difficult for you to be curious about. Our theme today is compassion. Who is it difficult for you to have compassion for? In this moment and in this hour, let God speak to you about what you could notice about that person if you looked closely and curiously. God of curiosity, we come to you asking questions questions about ourselves, about each other, and about the world, and questions about you and your holy presence among us. Help us to ask these questions with empathy and compassion. Show us hidden things we do not yet know. Let our investigations lead us to a deeper love, a quest for peace, and a boundless hope. Let our wanderings give voice to what we hear in our soul, let the scriptures inspire us to more deeply study your word and to hear you still speaking. Let us hear you ask us, what do you want me to do for you? And give us the courage to answer you and be healed. Amen. The scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 to 34. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. There were two blind men sitting by the roadside. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly ordered them to be quiet, but they shouted even more loudly, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. Jesus stood still and called them, saying, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. This ends our reading of ancient texts. May we be blessed with new understanding. So we are being called today to not only to listen, but to see, to see beyond ourselves, to develop compassion, understanding, and hope. Our music today expresses that so clearly, and we were all so very moved by the text that we wanted to be sure that you were able to read along and really understand and love the message as much as we did. So um, we'll be showing the slides with the text on while you're enjoying the music, and, and we hope that you are touched equally.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're in our second week of being curious, and this week uh, we are uh, focusing on the theme of compassion, uh, and particularly of compassion as an outcome, something uh, that can be cultivated by the practice of being curious. Now, curiosity, uh, from the beginning, we should say that curiosity uh, maybe isn't the strongest theme in scripture, right? And maybe it hasn't always uh, had uh, a strong theme in uh, practices of spirituality throughout the history, uh, particularly of Christianity. There are a lot of places and uh, teachers of scripture who who might give off an air of certainty, right? Uh, And really often the idea of faith can be, I think, confused with the idea of certainty. Uh, And certainty is the opposite of curiosity, right? It takes admitting that we might not know something uh, in order to be curious. So curiosity throughout uh, the history of of our faith uh, um, traditions has gotten a bad rap. I mean, especially if we go back to the beginning uh, and a lot of the theology and the ideology that's put on our faith, particularly Eve gets a really bad rap here, right? It's Eve's curiosity that gets her in trouble and therefore, you know, curses all humanity for the rest of forever. Uh, I don't have time to uncover and dig into that right now. (laughs) But let me just say, I think we're getting it wrong there, right? Um, And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, we have these sayings, curiosity killed the cat. Uh, Curiosity, until maybe recent history, really has not always been lifted up as a virtue, as something that we should be uh, teaching and instilling in our children or in ourselves. So I want to turn to our scripture today and suggest that curiosity, as Miss Amy talked earlier, uh, is often at the core of who Jesus was and who, how Jesus lived in this world. So first, it's important to place that small story. So we hear the small story of Jesus healing uh, two men who were blind on the street. Uh, And it's a familiar story. It actually shows up in lots of places. It's told in Matthew, almost the exact same story is told back in chapter 9, as is told uh, here in this section. Uh, But what's interesting is where we get this story. So for the verses uh, before these ones, in the first part of the chapter, we hear of Jesus and the disciples making their way toward Jerusalem. We're coming up to the end of the story in Matthew. And Jesus is teaching along the way, and he's teaching these really big ideas about salvation. We get kind of three speeches, three dialogues of Jesus talking about what salvation is and what it's for and who it's for and who is in and who is out, Uh, and and talking about uh, what is to come. And then we get this small story, so let's set that aside, about Jesus healing uh, two men on the street. And then after that, we uh, immediately get the story of Jesus and the disciples entering Jerusalem. So they've made it to Jerusalem, and we have the story that we tell every year on Palm Sunday of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, why that's important, um, and I chose this uh, piece of art, art by John August Swanson, Entry into the City, is because uh, the crowd plays a particular role in this story, right? Jesus is kind of gathering this crowd around him as he is teaching and as he is going into Jerusalem. And there is this idea that the salvation that Jesus talks about is a salvation from something really particular, that it's a political salvation, right? So there is this crowd around him and they have things to do, right? Like they are intent on Jesus going into Jerusalem and upending things, right? of offering some kind of uh, freedom from the Roman Empire that they have been living under for so long. 
And so in the story, this crowd is moving out of Jericho, and as they are going, two men shout for Jesus. And they use some really um, messianic terms for that, right? Like they, they call Jesus Lord and Son of David, kind of exalting him uh, to this really important role, right? One that fits with what the crowd is going for, what the crowd is gathering for. But rather than turn toward them, rather than take notice of these two men who the story tells us are blind, which in, in the time meant that they were very much excluded from most of society, right? That they didn't have a way uh, to be in community, that they didn't have a way uh, to secu find security for themselves. But the crowd is so intent on moving forward that they tell them to be quiet. They tell them, we don't have time for this right now. I'm reading into things, but this is what I imagine, right? <laughs> right? Like, don't bother Jesus right now, because we've got this really big, important thing to do. And Jesus is going to be the one that leads us into it. Now, luckily, uh, those two men don't listen to the crowds, and instead they yell louder for Jesus' attention. And when Jesus hears them, we're told that he stops. And he asks them, what can I do for you? What is it that you need from me? And they very clearly give him an answer, we need to see. We need to be able to see. So Jesus restores their sight. He draws close to them. He touches them. They're able to see. And then Jesus continues on his way, and they follow. Now we're told in there that when Jesus hears their request, he is moved by compassion for them. That taking the time to stop and to draw close and to ask what it is that they need moves him to compassion. And Jesus' curiosity and compassion then moves those two men into joining the community that is going on to Jerusalem. That it is Jesus' compassion and ability to see them that draws them in to community. What do you want me to to do for you is the curiosity that Jesus puts out there. Uh, an interesting note, um, you know, the text leads us to imply that everybody knows that these men are, are blind, right? That that is a defining feature of who they are. And yet, Jesus does not go into that, action, into that interaction being certain of what it is that they need. He doesn't go in assuming that they want to be healed of their blindness and instead asks them what they need. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read this book. I never thought of it that way uh, by uh, a journalist, Monica Guzman. Monica lives in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. She is a Mexican immigrant and she is all of the stereotypes that you would imagine go around uh, and are attached to a Mexican immigrant living in the San Francisco Bay Area. So she would call herself this really liberal and progressive person. But she's made uh, her writing uh, revolve over the last several years around uh, bridging political div divides because she is also the daughter of Mexican immigrants who vote very conservative um, and uh, who have been Trump voters more than once. Um, and so there's kind of this great divide between her and her parents, and yet she sees them on a weekly basis, and they have dinner together every weekend. And they have, uh, you'd think to do that, they would have to not talk about politics, but they don't. <laughs> they talk about politics every time that they are together. Uh, and she has 
uh, made it a part of her work to go about having these really hard conversations across political divides when she can. And her book is about teaching how it is that we uh, go into this world and this divided world with curiosity for people who are different than us. Now, I want to start by saying, um, often she tells this story um, about somebody going into conversations like this, and I think it was actually a pastor who, who lifted up how hard it is when we think about the opposite of us and people who disagree with us on every value uh, that we can think of. And he goes, you want me to go in and have conversations with the devil? And the person leading the workshop says, well, maybe don't start there. Right? Right? Like this work uh, of healing uh, the divide that we see in our communities and in our country and in this world shouldn't start by reaching the farthest person that you can think of, right? And in fact, uh, one of the things that Monica lifts up is that that is one of the things that's wrong, is that we uh, tend to think about that person who falls in a different category from us in the extremes, right? And that's not to deny that the extremes don't exist in this world. There are people with extreme views and policies and ideas who are out uh, to decay or erode what it is that we value. But what her research and what the research of others has shown is that we far exaggerate the other side and their values and their understandings of the world. Um, there was a CBS YouGov poll a couple years ago that said uh, most Americans, when asked to name what the biggest threat to the American way of life is, answered other Americans. Right? Most Americans answered. But that researchers at the University of Pennsylvania uh, who were looking into the hostile, uh, hostile, uh, I can talk today, hostility that existed in our world found that people on either side of America's political divide assume that the other side despises them twice as much as they actually do. So we go into interactions in this world assuming that people already despise us, that we already don't share anything in common, that we already believe they're out to get us. We go into these conversations far too often with certainty. And for Monica, that is at the heart of the divides that we face. One of the questions she asks uh, that really, uh, it got under my skin, was to think about who you spend more time thinking or talking about than you do talking with. Who do you spend more time thinking or talking about, whether that's an individual or a population of people that think or act or worship or vote differently than you do? Who do you spend more time thinking about than talking with? Recognizing the gap, she says, is to recognize that there is something that we don't understand between here and there, between me and them. And instead of seeing it as a wall that is impermeable, to see it as a gap of something I don't know. She offers uh, two questions. So often when we, I know for me, when I think about somebody who lives in a way that's really different than mine that I might find threatening to my way of life, the first thing I uh, think about is like, why do you think that way, right? Why is it that you have that idea? And Monica suggests that there are two far better questions to begin with. And the first is how did you come to believe what it is that you believe? Because every single person we talk with, every single person in this world has a story that is behind their beliefs, that is behind who they are and how they ended up where they are. And then, what are your concerns 
or if you wanted to put a positive spin on that question, what is it that you hope for? I'd like to suggest that when we go into this world with these questions, when we come up against people who are different than us, who think differently than us, and that might threaten us a little bit, that these are really courageous and faithful questions to ask of the world. Because they uh, acknowledge and show compassion for other people. Now, again, these are not questions that are going to solve anything. And Monica talks about that she has these really long conversations about the stories that come behind the ideas that people have. And she doesn't leave those conversations with her mind changed. And they don't leave those conversations with their minds changed. But they do leave those conversations knowing one another's stories and having some form of compassion for one another. These are really hard conversations to have. And so again, I want to suggest, you know, sometimes these conversations aren't ones that we should have, right? They can be um, dangerous. They can be conversations that we've had too many times with the same people who have hurt us or shown us reasons why they can't be trusted in that conversation. But that doesn't mean they're not worthy conversations or they're not worthy thoughts for us to be having about other human beings in this world. What is the story that brought you to where you are today? What are your hopes for this world? Because the research shows us that far more often than we acknowledge, we share more of those things than we think. This is uh, another piece of art that really struck me uh, this week from a Brazilian street artist. You probably can't read that. The text is really small. Eduardo Cobra. Um, and it's just a small piece of a really large piece of street art that he did featuring the eyes of um, his subjects, all of which were Nobel laureates, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, and Martin Luther King Jr., these people who are uh, known as being folks moved by compassion. And the thing he narrowed, narrowed in on was their eyes and their ability to see other people as human, to see people who uh, existed with this great divide between the world that they thought should be and the world as it is. And they were able to see with compassion and move humanity toward a place of healing, even if just one increment at a time. In response to their desires, Jesus is moved to compassion by the men he encounters in the street. And those two are brought into the crowd, into the community, into what came next. One of our readings today came from Bell Hooks, who wrote, Rarely, if any, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is always an act of communion. Healing is always an act that takes other people, that takes communion. Our opening uh, song today, I came into the sanctuary earlier uh, this week when Caitlin was rehearsing, and she pointed out that it's kind of a communion hymn. <laughs> and it is. It's a communion song. It talks about coming to the table. But everything that we do in living out our faith is about that. The story of Jesus is one of seeing people and seeing them up close in a way that you do as you gather around a table. It is a seeking of healing, not just in our own lives, but there, but also in our community and in our world. And it is a healing that can only happen when we are willing to look in the eyes of the other and be curious and be open enough to be moved to compassion. So I want to um, close by asking you uh, to think 
again, we had a centering question at the beginning of worship about who it is in your life that you find it really hard to be curious about and really hard to be um, compassionate toward. And I'm not saying that you need to go home and call that person or that group of people. Um, That is not always possible. But take some time to challenge yourself and to ask yourself what you think they might need in this world. What do they value? What do they hope for? And may we be moved by compassion. Like our, I was really grateful that Deb put the words for the choral uh, music up on the screens today that we might even just momentarily, as a spiritual practice, lay down our fears and see what we can find. Amen. May I invite the chair of our generosity committee to come on up. Now I can move that, Brooke, if you want to come up. Brooke DeRivers. On behalf of the generosity campaign committee, I'm excited to officially kick off and start our generosity campaign. If you've never heard of a generosity campaign, you're not alone. (laughs) As MCC is growing and making room for abundance, our stewardship campaign is evolving into a generosity campaign. So what's the reason for this change? Well, our church's participation in the Cultivating Generous Congregations course has highlighted our need to make room for more types of generosity from more types of givers. Our year-round generosity campaign puts MCC on more solid financial footing as compared to a seasonal stewardship campaign. And we're launching the Sustainable Giving Program here at MCC. If Sustainable Givers sounds like an ad for WPR, that's a good thing. WPR does a wonderful job engaging givers, donors, sponsors, and constantly thanking them. Our theme for this generosity campaign is making room for abundance. In one particular sermon about community, as told in John 10, Jesus says he comes so that God's collective people may have life and have it abundantly. We're experiencing a season of abundance here at MCC, and we're called to respond in kind. MCC exists so that all God's people, those here and those yet to arrive, might experience the abundant love of God's community. In response to this abundance, we're making room here. We have a new member class today following service. We welcome our new associate pastor next month. And we are inviting you to consider moving from an annual pledge to a sustaining giver program. Have you ever asked for something and gotten something back that's way better? Well, the Generosity Campaign Committee asked MCC staff for a thermometer to track our progress. Can you picture it? It's vertical, like a bubble, and you can color in red till you get to the top. Well, we got something much better to reveal. May I present you the MCC Generosity Tracker? First of all, it's circular. We are 100% reliant on the generosity of this congregation to operate. And as we receive pledges and sustaining giver commitments, we're going to peel off a piece of this gray to reveal vibrant colors you see in our logo. As you can see, our goal for this coming year is to raise 446,000. That's a 5% increase from last year. And as I personally move from a mindset of stewardship, trying to do the most with what limited funds we have, moving to a mindset of generosity, being open to God's plan for MCC, the abundant love God has for all of us, I'm curious if we will surpass that goal. Our website is updated, and you'll receive an email later today 
with information about our generosity campaign. I invite you to please join me in making room for abundance. Thank you. I'm supposed to bring a nice poster, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm in charge of the highway crew we have on our Adopt a Highway project. And uh, we have a nice little road about 15 minutes from here. It's about a two up mile section. And uh, I'll have to say what I would have done is I've sort of gotten a bunch of retired folks <laughs> to join me because, you know, we're still capable of taking stroll. And our, our road is relatively clean of trash except for the, the clown that likes to throw out his Bud Light cans. And <laughs> so we, it's a pretty easy job. We meet here at 9 o'clock and we're usually back by 11. And I've sort of scheduled for this week, and I've already got a crew of four people. So what I need is four more, because they like us to do work with eight people. But I actually have done it with four, and can easily do it with six. But I would so uh, my name is Nick Breitbach. So if you talk to me or Anne, you can get my email address, and I'll put you on the list. And when is when are you going out? The well, week? so far this week, our most crew we got Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Poor Dave here is the lone Wednesday guy, but <laughs> so anyhow, so if you can help us, you want to get on the list, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and moving into the rest of our announcements, a reminder uh, today, we'll probably extend it, but today was the deadline to fill out the connection questionnaire. Uh, the Board of Membership and Fellowship doesn't meet for another two weeks, so you've got time. Uh, please head to middletonucc.org slash connection to find that there and uh, help us to discern ways that we can better build connection here in the community. Uh, next, uh, we one of the ways that we do that is through our care team. We will be having a gathering of all people currently uh, involved in the care team or who would like to become or learn more about our care team on Thursday, October 10th from 3.30 to 5 out in Fellowship Hall. Our care team does a lot to care for members of the congregation and people within our community who are in need of prayers or cards. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten a card from, from the church. There's lots of you. Um, uh, or visiting people when they are in the hospital or unable to leave their homes. Uh, we organize meal trains for families or for individuals who are in need of a little help through a hard time or a hard season or providing rides to church or meetings or whatever it is that you might need. So there's lots of ways uh, to be involved in the care team. And if you'd be interested in learning more, I'd encourage you uh, to plan on coming to that meeting. Or if you're unavailable for that meeting, uh, you could talk to Jim Newman, who chairs much of that committee, and he can help get you connected. If you're curious about membership at MCC, next Sunday is New Member Sunday, and we'll be welcoming folks into the Covenant at MCC. Uh, we will have a class after worship today. That'll happen right here in the sanctuary, um, but it will happen right here in the sanctuary after the celebration singers are done rehearsing. I will go over that schedule at the end of worship, uh, but you'll have a little time to go out and get something to eat and a cup of coffee before heading back in uh, to learn more about what membership here uh, means and how it is that we function as a congregation. And then a reminder that next week, there's a lot going on next week too, we will be welcoming our new associate pastor, Reverend Rachel Kirk, for the first time. Woohoo! <laughs> the Celebration Singers will be singing, uh, and it is Food Sunday. Just like the first Sunday of every month, we will take a special collection for Way Forward Resources for their food pantry, so bring non-perishable food items to worship next Sunday. If you're wondering what they need most, there are lists on the barrel as you leave today that you can take with you to see some of their most uh, needed items at, the time, at this time. And then also after worship today is Faith Matters, which is our adult education hour that will start at 1045 down in the gathering room. And uh, quite in theme with uh, worship lately, the team that leads that is uh, going to host a listening session around one question, what does your soul need in an election season? What is it that you uh, need to care for yourself and your spirit in this season? 
uh, leading up to the election. I think that is all of our announcements. Unless Brian shows me something. Nope, that's it. So thank you to everyone who continues uh, to support MCC in whatever ways that you do. Uh, if you'd like to give a financial gift today, you can do so on our website through this QR code or going to middletonucc.org slash give. Or there are boxes as you leave the sanctuary, as you go out the doors and turn around, uh, there are wooden boxes on the wall. Friends, as you go from this place, I remind you that we do not exit, but we enter into a world where there is so much to be curious about. So I hope that you go from this place holding your questions as a holy practice. And as you are going, if you happen to be sitting next to somebody or walking out with somebody that you don't know or that you don't know well enough, I invite you to be curious about one another. Uh, as we continue to grow and make room in this place. As you go, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God look upon you with kindness and give you peace today and every day. Amen.